And now you're probably seeing the presenter view, huh? Yeah, but it's still the vertical strip. <laughs> yeah, the joys of digital, huh? Okay. So let's see here. Hmm, okay, let me stop sharing. Let me try something here. This is why we jump on early. I know. Yeah, I'm hosting. Yeah, I'm hosting yeah. our seminar series this this fall, yeah. and we go through this routine every every week. Yeah. Um, actually, what if I just share my screen rather than the app? Um, so now if I do that, that's perfect. That's perfect. Okay. I'll just do that then. And let me try that pointer again. So now you're seeing my laser pointer. Yes. Yep. That's very okay. active. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. That's it. Looking good. Okay. Good to go. Grab my coffee and be right back. All right. I'm sure Nathan, you know that there's usually some late late joiners. That's uh, fine. So we'll kind of I'll kind of monitor the participants here. Um, sure. But you know, we'll we'll we may we may delay a few minutes to get more of a quorum, but um, hopefully we'll start kind of on time. No problem. Okay. When when are the UTA seminars? Are they on Fridays? Friday's lunchtime. Yeah, it's kind of a weird slot. Uh-huh. Gotcha. And so where were you, Nathan, prior to uh, UTA? Were you? Um, I was at Berkeley doing a postdoc. And oh. prior to that, I was at um, UCLA doing a postdoc. And I did my PhD there also. Right. So right. I was in California yeah. for a long time. Yep. Thus the tectonics. Gotcha. But I was pleasantly surprised browsing through the uh, UT Dallas directory how many tectonics people there were. Yeah, it's really a, it's really a strength of the department. And yeah. uh, Dr. Stern, who you'll have to meet, he's he's uh, he's a big tectonics guy, and of course Martaza as well. But yeah, it's, it, it is a strength of the of the department. Yeah, I kind of rejigged my uh, my talk after I sent the title over to Martaza. I was looking through the faculty director and he thought, you know what, I need to focus this actually on uh, tectonics instead of erosion. So my second slide is me retitling this. Oh, so you've got a new title. At the oh, graph, well, it was- Yeah, okay, I got it. Tectonic upload, yeah. Good yeah, deal. This one, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you- Nothing just formal, just- uh, nope. Okay, sounds good. Did you grow up in uh, Dallas area, or you just ended up no, here for no. your career? Yeah, I, I'm from Michigan originally. Oh, my wife's from Michigan. Uh, whereabouts? I She's Detroit in, area. Yeah, I grew up in Saginaw. Uh huh. Yeah. But yeah. But, but we're going up there uh, over Thanksgiving. My mom and and I have a brother still in, that live in Michigan. So. Yeah, nice place. How about you? Were you? Uh, were you Montana. Oh, Montana. But you ended up at Illinois for a master's, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I uh, thought I was going to be an engineer. 
So I didn't uh, care where I was, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Well, I actually got my master's from UTA. Oh, okay, yeah. Back back in 1983. Oh, and cool. Yeah, the department is, as you may or may not know, it's it's undergone a lot of changes since then. Right. When I was rolling through there, it was it was it was an oil and gas had a, had an emphasis on oil and gas. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, but, we're. Um, what else in Montana are you from? Near Glacier Park. So, uh, do you know oh, Kalispell right. area? Like Soto or the other side? Sorry. Uh, anywhere near Soto or the other side of the place? Other side. Yep. Yep. The western side. Up in the tall trees. Yeah, lots of trees. Yeah, that was my childhood. Yeah. Do you spend Simon time in Shoto? Oh, well, just passed through. Um, went up to Glacier one time and uh, up your side and then came down the prairie side. Yeah, it's a gorgeous Re area. Recommended to everybody. Yep. Yeah, they just, uh, my parents are still up there and they're kind of disappointed. They, the park just implemented a um, permit system uh -huh. and they sell out within, you know, minutes of posting. So no one can get up into the park anymore during the summer because the permits just are gone in a flash. You mean just to go through Glacier Park? Yep. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's gotten so crowded there that they, um, they put a, a limit on the people that can be in there at a, at a time. Seems like it's sort of against the whole spirit on the other hand is i guess it's preserving it yeah there's no good solution Yeah, we will. We'll, 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 we'll hang out a few minutes. Sure, and, sure. Uh, there'll be people jumping on here. Yeah, I'm in no rush, so whenever. So Nathan, what is it you're teaching this semester? Mineralogy. Ah, that's Just, loads of fun. <laughs> uh, to be honest, it's the first time I've thought about mineralogy since like 2007. So it's I'm learning it about an hour before I'm teaching it. <laughs> I feel for you, man. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. But next, next term, I get to teach a geochronology class, so I'm excited about that. Oh, great. Right in your wheelhouse. Exactly. Yeah. Where's your office? Is it on the second floor? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm right next to um, um, 
uh, uh, John's office. Okay. Yeah, well, what's funny is uh, when I was going to school there, I took classes from Nestel, and he's still, still yeah. going strong, man. It's amazing. Yep, yep, and sharp as a tech. I know it. Yeah. All right, well, here comes some more folks. We'll just hang out for another couple minutes, uh, Nathan. And sure, then, uh, sure. We'll get rolling. Yeah, like Ming said, there's some classes that are just ending at four. So here we go. There's, there's, uh... Give it another minute and we'll get rolling. So how many undergrads are in your program there, Noel? Oh, you can make a liar out of me. That's a, that's a question for Dr. Lumley. Or Dr. Stern. What was that? Uh, the question was how many undergrads in our program? Oh, I think it's around 40. Oh, okay. And a similar amount of grad students, you know, it's half masters, half PhDs. So something like that. All right. Well, are you, are you all set, Nathan? Yeah, whenever you're oh. ready. All right. Um, let's go ahead and get started then. I'd like to welcome everybody to our uh, UTD uh, weekly departmental seminar. Today, we're extremely happy to have with us uh, Dr. Nathan Brown from UT Arlington. Uh, Nathan is a paternity geologist who, uh, I guess the best way to describe it is he looks at the evolution of the Earth's surface at all scales, everything from microscopic to big regional scale. And, um, his research interests include uh, luminescence dating, which we're going to hear about a little bit about today, also tectonics and uh, paleoclimatology. Uh, Dr. Brown received a, a BS from Wheaton College and a, a master's from the University of Illinois. He received his PhD from UCLA, and he did postdoc work both at UCLA and Berkeley. And the title of his talk today, as you can see, is Resolving a Transient Erosional Response to Tectonic Uplift in the San Bernardino Mountains Using Luminescent Thermal Chronology. So with that, Nathan, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Lowell. Uh, thanks to, to you all and Mortaza for this nice invitation. I'm happy to get the chance to finally meet some of my uh, colleagues across town. Um, Right, so today um, I'm presenting some work that I started in my uh, PhD and that I've been uh, kind of putzing along with the years since. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is <clears throat> slightly rejig the title. I know it's a little bit of a faux pas, but uh, I was telling Lowell as I looked at the directory, I noticed the, the strong tectonics uh, consortium you all have it. UT Dallas. So I thought it, this uh, focusing this talk on the tectonic evolution of this region might be uh, of more interest to you all. So we'll uh, we'll go with this new one. Thermal chronology suggests Holocene activity along the Mill Creek Mission Creek corridor of the San Andreas Fault. Um, so let's do it. Oh right. So I should uh, thank a bunch of people who have helped out with this work. Um, so uh, Solgi was my postdoc advisor at UCLA, um, and she and her PhD student Marina helped with a lot of the new cosmogenic basin averaged erosion rates that we'll see here. 
Um, they did that work in collaboration with Paul Bierman and Lee Corbett in Vermont. And then Ed Rhodes is my PhD advisor. Um, so he's helped out with some of these interpretations. And then lastly, Mike Oskin at UC Davis um, is sort of the regional tectonics expert that we've leaned on for some of these interpretations. So in the background of this title slide is um, the general setting for this talk. Here I'm standing on Ukaipa Ridge, looking over at uh, the San Gorgonio Ridge. And in between these two hills uh, lies what many assume to be the dead trace of the San Andreas Fault. Uh, this is the Mill Creek Fault. Um, and then off to the right there is Galena Peak. Uh, and that little saddle just to the left there, um, that's where Mill Creek Fault uh, ruptures through between those peaks. And it's been long assumed that this, this fault is dead. Um, I'll show you a couple pieces of evidence for that later in the talk. Um, but I'm going to suggest in this talk that, that maybe it's not, and that maybe we could have significant earthquakes that, that rupture through this area. Um, the landscape here is, is pretty incredible. Um, so this is right near a little town called Forest Falls. And as you enter the town, there are all sorts of signs um, warning you basically not to spend too much time there. It's, they have rock falls all the time, uh, flash flooding. It's just a very dynamic landscape uh, dominated by huge cliffs and giant boulders falling off those cliffs. Uh, here's my uh, PhD advisor collecting some bedrock samples next to a giant colluvial wedge there. Um, I like this photo because it's sort of representative of um, these hillsides on the Ukaipa Ridge in particular. Um, you can see there's hardly any soil mantling because these hills are just so tremendously steep that everything just kind of slides off. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty wild landscape. So now I'll switch over to my uh, laser pointer here. So the region we were just looking at all those pictures, that's on the Ukaipa Ridge here. Um, that starting picture, we were looking across this direction. Um, and so this, this fault here is the Mill Creek Fault. That's the one of these dead strands of the San Andreas Fault is the, the common assumption. And then the, the trade-off is this would be the active strand of the, the San Andreas Fault through this region going uh, through the Banning region. Uh, and I should also say this broader area would be the San Bernardino Mountains. So we'll talk a bit about those. So the San Bernardino Mountains then uh, are this region highlighted in red. Um, and this is often referred to as the, the San Gorgonio Knot. So the San Gorgonio Pass is down here. And it's a, it's a really complicated uh, setting. Um, it's not totally known how the San Andreas partitions its motion as it tries to make its way through the San Gorgonio Pass region, this, this knot, uh, structural gate. And, and part of this is uh, related to whether or not uh, an earthquake can rupture from the Salton Trough region uh, up through uh, the pass. So moving like this, and then continuing on towards the LA Basin. So as, as a rupture propagates into this knot, what happens? Um, there's some evidence um, that some earthquakes are, um, that they have historically occurred on both sides of the knot, meaning uh, that the earthquake managed to make its way through this region and continue northward. Um, so examples of those through going types of ruptures are shown here, for instances, uh, AD 1100, 1340, 1480, and 1688. But then there are others that seem to have ruptured until they reached this knot, and then they were blocked um, by this region. So understanding why and when that happens 
uh, is really relevant for um, quantifying seismic hazards in Southern California. Um, so let me show you now just um, a visual. I imagine many of you have seen this animation. This is the result of a huge effort um, by the Southern California Earthquake Center um, trying to uh, quantify sort of a worst case scenario, a through going rupture that starts in the salt and trough area and continues up towards Santa Barbara along the San Andreas Fault. Um, so this would be what happened, what would happen if an earthquake made it through. So I'll play that now. So you can see um, the minutes ticking away on this lower left-hand corner there. You can see the shaking hitting Palm Springs. And this is the point where it makes it through that knot. So if it does make it through that knot, then all of a sudden now you have severe ground shaking hitting San Bernardino, continuing on towards Disneyland, Anaheim, the Inland Empire, now Los Angeles, Santa Monica, San Fernando Valley, and it continues on towards Oxnard, And you'll look back to the LA basin and you see it sort of ringing like a bell in that thick sedimentary sequence there, strong shaking continuing. And now the front hits Santa Barbara. So the point is, um, if the big one makes it through the San Gorgonio knot, there are huge consequences. Uh, now, let's see if it'll let me advance. Mm -hmm. Let's try this. Oh, no. Okay, yeah, that might be it. Hmm. Uh, oh, okay, there we are. So now let me start sharing again. Um, oh, okay, I see it now. Now, let's see if we're back. Okay, can you see my screen now? Great. Okay, so, um, right, the animation I just showed uh, illustrates what happens if earthquakes make it through this San Gorgonio knot. Uh, another important part of this puzzle is understanding which faults in this area are active. So as I started the talk saying, um, for a long time, um, the banning strand of the fault was considered the active strand in this area uh, that controlled the northern rupture. But recently, there have been a series of papers suggesting that maybe the banding fault doesn't take even the majority of the slip in, uh, in this area. And that instead, uh, this Mission Creek uh, corridor is more important. So let me go back to my laser pointer. Right. So in panel A, you can sort of see the broader context. Um, so now I'm outlining. Um, this knot region right here. One of the ways that the San Andreas could um, get through the knot is kind of by going around a little bit. That's the banning strand that I'm um, outlining there. Another way though would be going through the knot 
Um, so that's the Mission Creek strand shown here. So these are sort of simplified in panels B, where Banning strand is dominant, or C, where the Mission Creek is dominant. So this is uh, a recent proposal uh, that's very um, controversial still. So at the, the annual meeting of the Southern California Earthquake Center, and there's a, a presentation by a lot of uh, prominent um, geologists suggesting that, that no, this, this can't be the case, that Mission Creek is an important uh, strand today. So we were left with this question, how likely is it for an earthquake to rupture through this structural knot along the Mission Creek fault strand? Well, in part that depends on which strands have been active in the recent past. But a major obstacle is there are a few offset sediments. So let me quickly just jump back here. Here's the setting. Uh, to figure out whether or not a fault can rupture through here, you wanna see, um, well, to date that event, you wanna have offset sediments that you can date with uh, luminescence or cosmogenic radionuclides, but look at how steep and rocky these regions are. There just aren't many geomorphic units um, that are preserved that you can use as uh, piercing points. And so now, this is where uh, luminescence thermochronology comes into place. Um, because we're sensitive to such low temperatures with this measurement that it should be uh, possible to uh, examine this possibility of, of uh, ongoing tectonic evolution. Okay, but to understand luminescence thermochronology, we need to take a step back and sort of get familiar with how this luminescence system works. So uh, within natural minerals, and this talk will look at K-feldspars, there's some latent amount of luminescence that we can measure. Uh, and this, this, the amount of luminescence depends on a balance of things. Uh, to fill up this luminescence, you need naturally occurring radiation within a rock body. Um, so from small bits of, uh, of uranium and thorium and potassium in your host rock, uh, you'll generate some uh, radiation field, also to a lesser degree, cosmic ray influence. So you're constantly exposing your K feldspar mineral to this ionizing radiation through time. Uh, and a luminescent signal can accumulate uh, as a result of that. But the signal can also deplete, and it can deplete when you expose that grain to sunlight or to sufficient amount of heat. So to sort of illustrate uh, how this happens, or first, I guess we're looking at the, uh, the age equation. So if you're able to measure the amount of absorbed dose in your feldspar mineral, and you can normalize that by the natural dose rate, then you end up with a luminescence age. So you should ask then age of what? Well, it would be the age since that grain was exposed to sunlight or to heat. Now you'll see in a second that um, there is a slight complication that within a single mineral grain, there are a range of signals that are sensitive to a range of temperatures. Um, so there's actually some rich stuff happening there. So then if you look across a landscape, you'll see uh, certain scenarios where uh, these feldspar minerals will be fully empty because of sunlight exposure. So at the surface, for example, sand grains blowing across a dune would have a clock set to zero, would have zero latent luminescence within them until they were buried and sequestered away from sunlight. Um, if you have a wildfire that passes over some soil, you'll have enough heat uh, influencing the, the soil immediately under the trees that you'll potentially reset that signal. Relevant to today's talk, if you have a block uh, that's exhuming along a fault uh, and you're bringing hot rock to the surface, 
where it's cooled, uh, then you'll have a clock that starts as soon as you reach uh, some colder temperature. And we'll quantify that in a second. This also happens at um, fairly small scales. So things like soil mixing, as you incorporate um, grains at the surface and through various pedogenic processes, incorporate them deeper into the soil profile, you'll have some gradient in time since a grain was at the surface. And that tells you something about how vigorous soil mixing is. You can also look at um, the bleaching front on boulders to learn how long they've been exposed to sunlight in the same way that you would use cosmogenics. So it's really a rich signal. Um, and in the past five to 10 years, luminescent scientists have sort of begun to appreciate how um, useful these signals are for a variety of near surface phenomena. Uh, and then lastly, just to get a sense of scale here, um, you can look at different regimes where this luminescent signal is empty because of sunlight exposure. So within the upper uh, centimeter or so, it becomes dark enough to build up your signal. Um, and then you'll have entirely filled traps uh, until a certain depth where geothermal heat is significant. So something like a kilometer or two below the surface, then you start to empty the traps um, by heat exposure. Okay, so now let's look for a second at the signal itself that we're going to be using today and how it responds to um, a thermal history. So I'm going to share another video and hopefully be able to get out of this one. Well, maybe not, we don't need that one. So if you stuck one of these uh, feldspar minerals in your machine and you heated that grain up from room temperature up to 500 C, you would see a certain intensity of light coming out. So we'll call that luminescence. And what you're really measuring is uh, photons per second that are hitting your instrument. So you would heat the sample up and at a certain temperature, you'd start to get these emissions and then they would peak, and then you would start to completely empty the signal uh, as you reached higher and higher temperatures. So this is what we'll call thermoluminescence. It's luminescence that we're releasing by heat exposure. Uh, and you'll see this throughout the talk labeled as TL. And this is related to the thermal stability of that natural signal. So, uh, a quick shorthand way to talk about TL curves is to say, what's the measurement temperature at which uh, you start to evict charge, at which your signal starts to come out? Um, technically, it's the measurement temperature where you're at half maximum intensity. So you could imagine measuring signals down here where the natural signal begins to emit at lower measurement temperatures. That would tell you that the natural population uh, was less thermally stable, that the natural population had to accumulate at lower temperatures, in other words. And if you measured a population further to the right, you'd have uh, a population that's uh, more thermally stable. Um, so only the most thermally stable population could survive, that is, the sample was probably at a higher temperature. Um, but simply, if you measure a lower T half value for the natural signal, you're looking at a population with a lower thermal stability. And this is a, a robust result. We can do this in the lab. So we can irradiate a sample and then we can heat it up to a known temperature for some amount of time. Um, and then we can uh, cool the sample back down and then measure it as if we were measuring a natural signal. So on the left-hand side, we're showing this. We've held the sample at 50 degrees C for a variety of times, and then we measured the signal. And then in blue, we held the sample at 100 degrees C and then uh, measured it as if we were measuring the natural. And as you hold the sample at progressively hotter temperatures, 
and then make your measurement, you can see that uh, for the highest temperatures and the longest durations, only the most stable populations survive. Uh, we can also do this numerically and we think we have a good idea at what's happening uh, behind the scenes. Uh, as a uh, further proof of concept for this, um, I went out and collected some samples from the USGS Core Research Center in Denver, where they archive a ton of um, cores that were mostly collected by um, exploration geologists. So these are some thick sedimentary sequences um, from some basins in Colorado and Wyoming and Alaska that have a wide range of uh, mean annual temperatures, ranging from negative 6 C all the way up to about 60 degrees C. And these three areas have been tectonically stable um, far longer than the time scales relevant to luminescence. Um, so these basins have been stable for over a million years, and luminescence is really only sensitive to uh, one or 200,000 years. And so in uh, the simple setup like that, what you see is uh, a fairly clear relationship that those samples which are held at cold temperatures for a long time uh, can populate those less stable uh, positions. And so as you're heating the sample up, this uh, sediment that was kept at negative 4C uh, begins to emit at a much lower measurement temperature meaning that really thermally unstable population is still naturally persistent because it was so cold. So we can plot that up here in D. Uh, the x-axis here is just the burial temperature and the y-axis is our measurement. So as we heat the sample up, what's the uh, measurement temperature at half maximum intensity? And as a side note, this is actually useful for paleo temperature uh, estimation. I think, though, I'm going to skip over this for now because we might run low on time. Um, so let's imagine a more complicated thermal scenario, though, uh, rather than just um, a quiescent sedimentary basin. So what happens if temperatures change? So let's do a quick thought experiment. Um, we have a range of natural thermal stabilities present within our mineral. So that's shown here in this panel. Um, so this is just a, a PDF, I suppose. The number of traps as a function of stability. Um, so let's hold this imaginary sample at some high temperature through time. So we're going to march forward through time and see what happens. So if you hold it at this hot temperature, those most stable sites will begin to accumulate until they're full. So eventually your traps will saturate after some amount of time. Um, and so this would be the arrangement if we just held it at the same temperature through time. But what you can do is now drop the temperature. And then if you march time forward, you open up a new regime of stability. So less stable sites can begin to accumulate and they'll do that until they fill. But now, before that intermediate zone has completely filled, we're going to drop the temperature again and we'll begin to accumulate. And I think by now you can probably intuit that this implies that you can resolve a continuous time temperature history with this signal, so long as you're cooling fast enough uh, that your most stable sites haven't completely filled. Um, so there is a, a lower limit to the cooling rate that you can resolve. Okay, so now I'm going to show you um, sort of the methodology for this study, and then we're going to get into the actual uh, measurements and uh, look at the tectonic implications. Uh, so what we actually do is for a given measurement temperature, given instrumental temperature, we get an apparent age from our samples. 
Um, at each of those measurement temperatures, there's a, an associated thermal stability. And numerically, we can approximate how that would evolve through time uh, as a sample cools and get a closure temperature. You can then show closure temperature as a function of apparent age. And then you can convert that into a cooling rate as a function of apparent age. The last thing that we'll do that's sort of a crude approximation, but uh, you'll see it's fairly useful in this case, is we'll say, we'll assume a uniform geothermal gradient of about 30 C per kilometer, which is uh, what's been assumed for um, appetite helium thermochronometry in the same site. So if you do that, then you're left with uh, an erosion rate uh, through time. Okay, so that's the basic lead up. And now we'll start looking at the results. So here we have uh, the study location. So um, down to the south here, we have this, um, what's normally assumed to be the main route of rupture for the San Andreas Fault. Up here is where we started the talk. Um, this is Eukaipa Ridge. Um, this is the area that's assumed to be dead. And we have samples from both sides of this fault that's assumed to be dead. Um, so San Gorgonio block up here, Eukaipa Ridge block down here. Here are the, the relevant faults. Uh, so the San Bernardino strand of the San Andreas Fault, the Mission Creek Fault up here, the Galena Peak, uh, and the Mill Creek Fault here. Um, one of the reasons that uh, geologists have uh, labeled this fault zone as inactive recently is the Mill Creek jump off site. Um, so in our initial photo, that was off in the, in the background. So we looked at Galena Peak and to the left there was that saddle. Um, that's the Mill Creek jump off. Uh, so here, as uh, from a recent paper, this is a Google Earth uh, image uh, of this region. It's too steep to really approach very closely. Um, but you can see the, the fault zone here and draping over this fault zone is undisturbed uh, colluvium that's assumed to be, um, generally assumed to be Holocene in age uh, due to soil development, though it hasn't been directly dated. So because of that, um, workers have, have said that this fault has been inactive recently. Okay, now uh, we're going to fold in some low temperature traditional thermochronometry, some appetite helium thermochron that's sensitive to sort of million year time scales. So these uh, crosses that I'm showing you here are the locations of appetite helium bedrock samples that were collected uh, by others. Um, so this is one of those studies uh, by Jim Spatilla. Uh, and for this, they were studying the entire mountain range, the entire San Bernardino range. Uh, and what they found was that the uh, Eukaipa Ridge itself uh, was exhuming extremely quickly uh, until about 1.2 million years ago. And since then, there's not much constraint. Um, so it could have continued to exhume and then stalled out uh, until today, or it could have uh, exhumed at some average rate since 1.2 million years. They don't really know. Uh, the next data set that we're going to fold in our catchment average erosion rates. So these are brilliant 10 uh, measurements from stream sediments uh, that are relevant on thousand year time scales. So we're going from aptite helium, which is million year time scales to brilliant 10 thousand year time scales. So pretty disparate uh, time scales. Uh, and the way I'm going to show this, I'll outline the catchments and then the color scaling is shown Let's see, color scaling is shown over here. Uh, so the erosion rate in millimeters per thousand years. Um, so I'll show you the different regions. So we have the, the Southern San, uh, San Gabriel, San Gorgonio block here, uh, the Northern Eukaipa Ridge, 
and then the southern Ukaipa Ridge. In general, you see the Ukaipa Ridge eroding faster than the San Gorgonio, um, but there's some subtlety there that we'll try to get into. Okay, finally, we're going to add this new data set, our luminescence, our thermoluminescence TL erosion rate. And the first way we'll look at this is the magnitude of the marker, the bigger the marker, the greater the erosion rate. And I'm going to throw, show you um, three time bands. So the circles will be 10 to 20,000 years, uh, the squares 50 to 60, and the triangles 90 to 100,000 years ago. So the erosion rates at those times. So I'll color code them uh, the same way we outlined the, the basin averaged erosion rates. So first look at San Gregonio and then you Kuiper Ridge. Then we'll have a couple ridge top samples here. And then a couple more samples descending on the southern side of the block. Um, so here's our data set um, from 30,000 feet. And now we're going to try and break it up a little bit and do some interpretation. Here I'm showing those same data, um, but sorted by time. So what we're looking at are these different regions. So the Southern San Gorgonio block is shown in the top panel there. This is the luminescence results. The Northern face on the East for Ukaipa, Northern face on the West, the ridge line and the Southern face. And then you can compare those directly against the beryllium 10 uh, catchment average erosion rates on a thousand year time scale right here. And the appetite helium uh, exhumation rates, erosion rates, if you like, on this panel over here. So a few things to notice. Uh, before we collected this data set, we knew that there was broad agreement uh, between the million year and thousand year timescale measurements, even though they're, they're capturing different things geologically in, in important ways. We knew there was general agreement, so we knew we had to um, be in the same ballpark of, with the erosion rates that we ended up with. And so um, we're happy to report that in most cases, we are getting similar magnitudes. Uh, I mean, this is a logarithmic y-axis, so you're looking at four, uh, three orders of magnitude difference. Uh, so it's, it's a big spread. Um, but broadly, we're capturing um, similar magnitude erosion. Um, but we're getting some time resolution. And so from 100,000 years towards 10,000 years, uh, I think a general observation is there seems to be a decrease in erosion rate uh, at all at most of these sites. Um, I put here that perhaps the north uh, northwestern face of Ukaipa uh, may not have that same systematic decrease. Um, in other words, it stays as high as um, uh, about a meter per thousand years um, across that region. You can argue that this, this sample is decreasing, but I'll, I'll show you why that's happening in a second. So those are sort of first order observations. Now let's break those down a little bit. Um, first, we'll zoom into a transect across the Kuiper Ridge. Okay, so here's uh, some recent LIDAR imagery. We're just looking at um, slope. So the coloring on this is the slope going from uh, zero up to about 55 degrees. The San Gorgonio block up here, and then the Kuiper Ridge uh, shown there. So what I'm going to plot here are the luminescence erosion rates, and they're colored um, from white to this uh, sort of dark pink. And in this area, the rates go from about 16 to about 319 millimeters per thousand years. Um, I'm going to compare them directly to other sites in a second. Um, so that's why we sort of have this funky y-axis. Uh, but for now, you can just notice a general trend. We seem to have um, higher erosion rates toward the base and uh, lower erosion rates on the ridge top, which is somewhat sensible. Um, we can plot this a little bit systematically here. Uh, so here we're plotting the measured TL erosion rates as a function of elevation. 
And in general, for all three time periods that we're looking at, 10 to 20,000 years, 50 to 60, and 90 to 100, there seems to be a greater erosion rate at lower elevations. Another thing to notice is how much lower the erosion rate is at this particular sample. So this sample, I think, is capturing a, a paleo surface. So I've uh, replotted this topography to emphasize um, the most gradual surfaces. Uh, and it's known in this area that there are some relic surfaces. And so I think that um, that anomalously low erosion rate is because the erosion hasn't communicated all the way up that hillside. Okay, let's go jump across uh, the Mill Creek Fault to the San Gregonio block. So now we're seeing that here. We can compare the erosion rates at this side um, by using a common axis. So here, the coloring in this panel goes from 52 to 139. Um, so you can see that we're capturing, in general, a similar erosion rate for these two sites. But uh, it's important to note that we're getting spatial resolution here as well that's uh, a little bit novel. Uh, so even though we've measured this catchment with beryllium 10, with this in situ luminescence measurement, you can see um, the enhanced erosion due to this active uh, erosional scarp uh, propagating. Um, so this, this location on a modern cliff uh, is measurably higher than the erosion rates on the bench above. So even though uh, all three, so these three samples are shown here, all three are broadly consistent with the basin averaged uh, erosion rates, we're, we're getting additional resolution spatially. So then lastly, let's hop over here. So this site, which is, I'll show you again, on the northwestern uh, portion of the Kuiper Ridge, uh, has significantly larger erosion rates. Um, and within this site itself, there's uh, this sample near the mouth of that gully uh, is showing a lower erosion rate than the sample on this head wall. Um, and I think this is one of the cooler things um, to come out of this data set. So if you look at these two samples in particular, um, and you look at the apparent erosion rates through time, you can um, predict how much erosive difference there is between the two. Uh, in other words, since about 50,000 years, you'd expect 77 more meters to erode at this site than that one. When you plot that on the landscape, it's kind of a comparable um, spatial scale to the, the gullying that we see there. So uh, it, if you believe it, uh, we may actually be seeing this happen from 50 to 30,000 years ago, which I think is uh, pretty cool. Uh, another thing you can do with the data set like this is look at whether there's a gradient in uplift as you go from west to east. So um, this is the site we were just looking at. Let's compare that with these three samples over here. It's been predicted in the past um, uh, based on structural arguments that the west should possibly be exhuming faster. So we can test that here. Uh, and in, in fact, we do see that general pattern. So the eastern side shows a similar deceleration in erosion since about uh, 40 or 50,000 years. Uh, so that pattern is, is in common, but the western side seems to be uh, about three to four times uh, higher erosion rate. And notice also that uh, sample 214, which is separated by this Galena Peak Fault, seems to be a little bit decoupled uh, from the other samples in this site. 
Okay, so going back to the original question of uh, which faults might be active, uh, our way to approach this is looking for erosional contrast across faults. In other words, if you see uh, drastically different erosion on one side of a fault than the other, uh, a reasonable conclusion would be there's greater uplift uh, that's feeding into that erosion, that's driving that erosion rate. And therefore, maybe the intervening fault might be active. So we looked at four configurations of which faults are active. So if you assume that uh, the Mission Creek fault is, is driving the motion, you can transfer slip to the Mission Creek fault in different ways. Uh, in this first option, it doesn't have any contribution from the other faults. In option two, it receives slip from the Mill Creek fault or it can receive slip from the Galena Peak Fault or both. So we're able to, to look at these, th uh, these four scenarios with our data. Uh, and our predictions are, um, if there's no motion along either the Galena Peak or the Mill Creek Fault, you would expect relatively high erosion rates for all of these as this entire block moves as a unit uh, along the, the San Bernardino Strand. Instead, if the Mill Creek uh, facilitates slip, uh, you might expect there to be greater erosion on the Kuiper Ridge block and lower erosion on the San Gregonio. Um, same if that uplift happens across the Galena Peak Fault, uh, except then you would also have the Northeastern Kuiper having lower erosion. And if both faults were active, you might expect some gradient in the, the erosion. Uh, so then if we, uh, to wrap this up, if we plot the ratio of erosion rates for all the samples that we find on either side of these faults. So we'll look at the Kuiper Ridge Northeast, this one here, compared to the San Gregonio block, this one here. Um, that ratio seems to be about one. In other words, there doesn't seem to be much differential erosion across the Mill Creek Fault going from this site to that site. But if we compare Yukaipa Ridge Northwest with the San Gorgonio block, it experiences a significantly greater erosion rate. So there does seem to be differential erosion happening on the Yukaipa Ridge Northwest relative to the San Gorgonio block. And our preferred interpretation is that um, one of these two scenarios is responsible and uh, that uh, uplift across the Galena Peak Fault uh, and possibly the Mill Creek Fault as well uh, are consistent with our data set. Um, okay, so to, to wrap this up then, the observations we have from this data set are that luminescence thermal chronology is capable of resolving in situ erosion on time scales of 10,000 years to 100,000 years. The results that we get are broadly consistent with catchment average beryllium 10 erosion rates and aptite helium thermochronometry. Um, but we're able to add some spatial and temporal detail uh, that's not available with the other techniques. Uh, one main geologic outcome of this would be uh, that the western end of the Ukaipa Ridge tends to exhume uh, faster than the eastern end, and that the Ukaipa Ridge. Uh, is exhuming relative to the San Gregonio block, uh, which has implications for which faults are active. Uh, so we see a general slowdown of erosion since 100,000 years, um, suggesting that, that maybe, uh, maybe you're seeing less uplift through time across these faults, um, but you, you still throughout that time period see an erosional contrast across um, the Galena Peak Fault. So uh, I think there's, I think this data set is supportive of recent findings that that perhaps the Mission Creek Fault is active in the Holocene. Uh, and so with that, I'll wrap it up and take any questions you might have. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Nathan. That was that was really pretty interesting. Very interesting. And um, yeah, if there's any questions out there. Um, you can either unmute and ask or uh, feel free to, to 
type uh, your question in the chat line. So, um, any questions? Maybe, uh, maybe while they're um, some of the grad students may be thinking of some some questions. I actually have a a question. Would you mind going back to um, one of your early slides where you showed the knot? Oh yeah. Let's see. On this one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so if I'm reading this right, you're suggesting that this southern pathway then could still be an active pathway. Is that correct? So yeah, the the mill creek fault that, that we are looking at is kind of like this. So yeah, yeah. Okay, and so um, yeah, like you showed in your animation, that would have drastic uh, consequences, or could have drastic consequences for LA and and, and areas to the north. Um, if if that if that wasn't active, though, would would there be the potential that I mean, would a big quake still be able to transit through that through that region? Yeah, I, I think the 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 working hypothesis for most people today is that um, uh, an earthquake would propagate through this route. So yeah, if this uh, if the Mill Creek route that we were talking about today is inactive, uh, then presumably a breakthrough rupture would happen along the San Bernardino Strand. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think that the important part from a hazards perspective is an earthquake that breaks through this route is going to um, carry a different energy signature and a different shaking signature um, than one that goes here. So that's part of the answer. The other part is uh, to really capture the recurrence interval of these faults uh, in a robust way. Uh, it's important to know which history we need to be thinking about. Because if we're seeing uh, faults or if we're seeing earthquakes every, you know, 500 years from a trench on this fault right here, uh, and we say that's the, that's the answer, that's the recurrence interval for these large faults, but we're missing half of the slip uh, over here, then maybe you're basing your hazards on a recurrence interval that's far too long. And maybe you should be expecting big earthquakes more frequently. So there are lots of um, hazards implications on where and when and uh, how often these, these big earthquakes happen. Okay, great. So there's a question from Bob Stern. It says, can you explain how TL works and how it is measured? I think you, you kind of covered that. Maybe you could uh, just briefly again. Yeah. Um, so how it works is, let's see. Um, right. Okay. So maybe this slide is kind of the simplest way. Yeah. Uh, so there's a constant buildup rate. Uh, whenever you have a mineral within a rock, it's going to be accumulating a signal um, always just because of ambient ionizing radiation. Um, so that is a constant. What's variable is the amount of heat that's emptying that signal out. So when you're deep in the crust, you have high geothermal heat, uh, and therefore the net signal tends to be zero because the, the thermal loss is much greater than the, the gain by radiation. And when you're at the surface, uh, the gain by radiation is much greater than the loss by heat. And so you, your signal builds up until it eventually saturates. Um, how it's measured is we take a chunk of bedrock back to the lab that we keep dark because any light exposure resets the signal. And we break into the interiors of these rocks, put our feldspar onto the instrument, and we, we shine a laser light onto that uh, sample. And the intensity of light that comes out tells us how much luminescence has accumulated within that signal. Um, and that's related to the, the thermal history of that sample. Well, well thank you. No, I, I did get this part, but you keep talking about signal. 
And I'm wondering what's actually happening inside the mineral. Yes. Um, so uh, the mineral is acting like a, um, like a semiconductor. Um, so uh, you, you fill electron traps. So this ionizing radiation is, is always exciting some electrons into the conduction band and they can get trapped in these higher energy states. And so what we're doing in the lab when we're shining light on the samples or heating the samples up is we're detrapping those activated electrons that have become activated because of their geothermal history. And when they relax back down, they give off light. And the intensity of that light that we're measuring is proportional to, that's what I'm calling the, the signal. Okay, so the electrons are trapped where are they trapped? I mean, aren't are all the orbitals filled already? They're trapped at defect sites. Yep. So you have, oh, okay. yep. Um, so it's just a way you can think of it as the mineral sort of archiving um, how much extra uh, radioactive energy is received through time. And it just stores it in these higher energy states. Okay. So um, when you measure it, you just heat up the the mineral and then see how what the total amount of re, re, released energy is exactly and how yep, much so, do you have to heat it up to uh so about 500 c to get most of that signal out yeah like paleo mag yep yep okay thank you sure yes i have a follow-up question from dr stern mm -hmm. Yeah, so I am a paleomic person, so it's somehow it's like similar to us. We also measure like reheating measurement and reheating again. So my question is, uh, how do you deal? Uh, first question is, uh, is there any effect of lightning strike on the sample in the field? Like when it is in exposure, there may be a lightning strike. And is there any effect of lightning strike on the specimen? And if there is, how do you deal that in the lab? Oh, that's interesting. Um... I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what the, what the signal would be. I mean, I, so we don't normally think of, of lightning strikes in the context of luminescence, but we often think of wildfires. Um, there's always this question, you know, we know that these areas burn uh, multiple times during a person's lifetime. Um, and if you have such intense heat near the surface, uh, maybe you would expect that there's not a measurable luminescent signal anywhere, yet we observe it. So um, I think partially it depends on where you collect the sample. So a lot of these are coming from cliff faces where presumably you're not going to have um, direct exposure to wildfire or presumably lightning strikes. Um, but the short answer is I, I don't know exactly what a lightning strike would, would look like in this signal. Yeah, anyway, thank you. It was an interesting talk and journey. Thanks. Hey, uh, anybody else have any questions for Nathan? So I, I've got a, a question. So you're at UT Arlington. Is your research still in uh, Southern California or are you working around here? Well, yeah, so I'll, I'm hoping to continue working in Southern California and start adding some, some projects around here. Actually, um, a lot of what I do is not related to thermochronology. It's just uh, sediment dating. So I'm hoping to get some sites going on the Trinity River, looking at meander dynamics and uh, things like that. But yeah, I'm hoping to also go back to Southern California. Because I, I was thinking that, uh, do you know about the Wichita Mountains in Southern Oklahoma? Uh, a little bit. It might be really suitable for your study um, uh, to see, see if, I don't think anybody uh, has ever done any thermoluminescence on it. And it would be a chance for students to learn something about it. I don't, what does it take to set up a lab to do this? Uh, well, uh, you need a luminescence reader is the main thing. Uh, so it's a, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollar automated instrument. You need a dark lab, um, but cheaper than like a mass spec, something like that. So it's, it's feasible. So what are you setting up for your lab? I guess you're just in the process. Yep. So the instrument is due in January if, if things haven't changed. Um, so 
we should be equipped to make those measurements probably by early spring. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, let us know if you're interested. Cool. Yeah. The, the only constraint would be it's got to be erosion since about 200,000 years. So if, if the signal you're looking at is much older than that, then these measurements won't be of much use to you. Um, so I don't know the context of those mountains enough. Yeah, you, I think, we, I think we're, we're, we need a field trip for you. Cool. Sounds great. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Um, anybody else? Any other questions for Nathan? Uh, departmental. Thanks, Dean. Good question. Yeah. Um, yes. In general, the answer is, uh, is yes, but um, the luminescence properties of most minerals are not ideal. Quartz is the next uh, best option, but uh, the luminescence signals from natural quartz tends to be overprinted by signals from zircon uh, and zircon just fades away um, uh, too much to be useful. So, and and the third part of that is um, it takes a lot of time to uh, properly characterize how these minerals are behaving. So when they receive a natural dose, they'll behave in a certain way. When they receive a lab dose, um, do they retain that signal or is it leaking away through time? Um, what temperature does it take to start to deplete these signals? So, yeah. 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 I, I think, so a lot of this is, is brand new. People have started thinking about this only, you know, 10 years ago. So um, there's still a ton of work to be done. And I think looking at which other minerals might work well is, is a great thing to do. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other final questions for Nathan? Well, if not, um, Nathan, again, we'd like to, we can't thank you enough for, uh, for spending your time today. That was, oh, really, this is a treat. Thank you. Yeah. Very interesting. And, and we're really happy to have you, uh, in the area. Um, hope we can maybe, you know, get some, uh, collaboration going as Bob suggested, that would be really neat. I think yeah. the, stu the students would be, uh, yeah, very interested in, in, uh, in learning more about this. So, um, definitely. Uh, yeah. I'd love to meet all of you in person at some point. And if, if any of you find yourself over here, you're welcome to come tour the lab and, and all the rest. So yeah, I look forward to meeting all of you at some point. Great. Well, we, we wish you the best, Nathan. And, and okay, thanks again. Thank you. And, um, so that's going to wrap up, uh, for today. And that wraps up our, actually our fall program. And, uh, so Mortaz and I are, are busy, uh, putting together the spring program. So we'll be back. Uh, keep your eyes open sometime in January, mid, mid to late January, we'll, we'll start up again. Okay. So thanks everybody. Have a safe and happy uh, Thanksgiving, safe travels, and we'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Nate. Thank you.